tonight for that interview. Um, a very, very meaningful and insightful one. I hope um, there's a lot, definitely was a lot to take from that interview. Um, on the other side of this, we are joined by Prophet Katleho Mohase to also shine and paint a different picture on African spirituality and religion. Prophet, very, very warm welcome to the chat room. Thank you so much, Mike. It's such a privilege to be with you and a very good evening to the listener. Absolutely. Um, and firstly, uh, I'd like you to just, you know, personally um, enlighten our listeners on the work that you do and exactly maybe you, where you are located as well. Chief, so I'm, I'm in the Alberton area mm. um, and I tend to have consultations, as it were, with people as well. Um and I was listening uh, a bit to the conversation that you had with uh, the good doctor before yes, this. Yes. Um, so yeah, I my own journey is, is is very similar. You know, people started calling me uh, Muruti from the age of seven, eight. There it was. Uh, had a calling at around thirteen. Um, navigated all of that. Uh, didn't uh, go and get initiated because at the time I was of the view that no, I don't want to do that. Uh, but the gift is very strong on both sides of my family, so then I decided to use it in the church, mm. um, and that's 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 where I find myself at the moment. And that's um, you would then say, um, you were listening to the interview prior to this one. Um, that how would you then say your gift differs from the good doctor, as you called him? <laughs> oh no, no, the gift is exactly the same. Yeah, I think the thing is that uh, too often we as people in the church have demonized um, gifts and I think that it's important for us to firstly realize that gifts are neutral. Gifts come from God Mm. Um, and because gifts come from God and I again I will say I use a biblical understanding to these things. Gifts come from God and because they come from God what we do with them then will dictate whether the gift remains a pure one or whether it becomes something else. So, so a gift is given, for instance, uh, I'm, I, my surname is Mukhase. Mm. The prophetic gifting, the prophetic office was given to the first Mukhase um, by God. And because that's the case, we owe it to go back to God and understand what it is that he wanted us to do with the gift. So that's, that's a place where perhaps uh, I, I tend to differ sometimes uh, by people that would say uh, that uh, or I have given them the gift. And I think mm. God has given us the gift. Mm. Mm. And because God has given us the gift, he's the primary source of information. I think that the ancestral realm is a secondary source of information. Mm. And I think contrary to popular belief, I do not think that the ancestral realm is an omniscient one. I think that God knows more than that ancestral realm. And uh, if you go back, people would believe that ancestors would act as intermediaries as it were, dealing with familial issues. And so in dealing with those familial issues, you must go back to the person that decided there will be this family in the first place because it didn't osmose out of nowhere. So when God decided that the Mukhasa family should be here, he gave it a particular covenant, he gave it a particular purpose. And ours is to find what that is and to work with it and to understand where our ancestors went wrong and where they went right and to get the necessary advice, perhaps they visit through dreams, through consultations or whatever, and then we go back to God and we continue in that fashion. Okay, so um, I think what stood out for, for me from your answer is that you said the gift is from God mostly and most importantly. Um, but yeah. sometimes you find that there are then some consequences that kind of happen, um, negative ones, um, might I add, that happen if, you know, one does not make use of the gift that they, you know, supposedly have. So then would you say that it is God um, punishing the people for not making use of that or... So, so, so maybe let me put it this way, and it's an isolated incident in the Bible, if you will. Uh, so a lot of people, when we do study theology, they say you shouldn't make doctrine out of one incident. But let's just go with it for a bit. There's a gentleman called Saul in the Bible. The, the book of Acts speaks about him. I think it's chapter 9, as it were. And he has a particular evangelical and apostolic gift. And then he goes and persecutes Christians, but he's then called by God. And in the process of being called by God, note calling and gift, same, né? as mm, the African mm, spirituality mm. was speaking about. Then he gets sick, he goes blind. He's blind, and in that moment, after that blindness, so that's a spiritual disease, in that blindness, then there's a gentleman that is told, I think it's uh, um, Ananias or Barabbas, I just forget the name, 
that is told you that this person is going to come to you and is going to come to you for healing. And I understand you are scared of him because he's been persecuting Christians, but I've sent him to you. So do you not think at that moment that looks like a Kovela? Because you are an initiate, you are sick due to a spiritual cause, and you have to go to a particular person that is revealed to you. And when you get to that place, then you are able to get help and you are able to function in your gifting. So if that's the case, and we understand that story from an African lens in the way that um, perhaps I've just described it, then we understand that the sickness itself is brought on by a non-acceptance of the gift. Not necessarily because the gift is there to help people. So all the gifts of God are there for the edification of people and for helping of people. So now you can imagine that you are meant to assist, let us, let's assume, a hundred people. And then you refuse on that. And so those people's prayers are leaning on you to do what you need to do. Sure, God can use somebody else. But the fact that you have refused in the supernatural realm, Mm. obviously your body will react because you are a spiritual being as well. So all of those prayers would then now be the reason why it is that you are falling sick because you are the one that God has given solutions to for those people and you are not acting in that gifting. And by the way, when we say gifting, we're not restricting ourselves just to uh, isquama as it's known or these spiritual gifts of dreams and healing. It can be a gift to law. It can be a gift to music. Mm. It can be a gift to social work. It can be a gift to business. There are people who are also sick spiritually, yeah. but their sickness that is spiritual is actually depression. It's actually not having a job. It's actually about to come in and saying, well, isn't those amas hungry? Yeah. The popular yeah. line that people are using. That could be emblematic of a spiritual disease that you are having because you're not using your gift. Okay. All right. Um, thank you so, so much for clarifying that one for me. I think um, I really need it um, to, you know, get that clarification sure. um, from that. But also then these days, um, Prophet, you find that, and here, a lot of our, our generation mostly um, proclaiming that they are rather spiritual, but not religious. So um, I don't believe in going to church, perhaps is what some of them would say, but I do believe in prayer and, and, and things like the universe as well. So is it really possible to be spiritual without being religious? I think that maybe let me answer that twofold. On the one hand, I think that a lot of people have a particular leaning towards religion because it creates a framework, Mm. right? And also, a lot of people like religion, and in this bracket, I'm going to also include um, African spirituality because it's starting to start to look like a religion now. It's starting to become very much formalized. There are, you know, systems that are being put in place and practitioners. So, people like religion because it's got a set of rules and it's got a set of outcomes. So I don't necessarily have to do a lot of work. I just do this, I perform this ritual, I get this money. You understand what I'm saying? So what what a lived experience of relationship with God, or what then would be uh, biblical spirituality, would require you to do the work, would require you to pray, would require you to have faith, would require you to understand when God says no and he doesn't have something better for you. Mm. Would require that when you go through particular storms that they are God-ordained. So the number one question that a lot of people would come and consult about is, my things are not okay. I need you to fix it. You, You get that where the question is coming from is, I need you to do something for me, and I'm going to pay for it, but I don't want to do the work. So, So it becomes a quick fix. And I think that the generation at the moment is starting slowly to do the work of saying, okay, who am I? What is my surname? What, you know, all of the stuff that are necessary to place me in terms of identity. And then after that, um, we still fall back into the trap of saying, ah, let me go consult quickly and let's just get rid of this thing and then I'll be fine. And I think that that's the, the distinguishing thing between this religion and, and, and the spirituality. In the second vein, for me, I think that... Uh, Everything is under attack, everything is under threat, everything is under exposure. So the church is being exposed for its own ineptitudes. Even African spirituality is being exposed for places where perhaps it lacks because we're living in a generation that's questioning everything. And I think 
in people questioning it at a philosophical level they've got to also then start to question what works for them and in arriving at a place that says i don't want to go to church i think the only caution that i would give there is that isolation kills so even if you're not going to church let's have people around you Mm. that would be able to help you keep you accountable keep you growing and then you're okay okay all right um and then you know i personally was born into church uh, and i am a christian of course but and inherently i feel like um that is the case for a lot of people who are christians they just you know are grow they grow up they are born into it and they grow up um um being christian rather because you know their families are christian but having to then be exposed to something different or more knowledge and getting educated sometimes you know kind of you find that you're your values and your beliefs sometimes you know are questioned and they clash so i have to ask you is christianity a western form of belief or tradition absolutely not um absolutely not if you'd ask me is christianity an eastern form of religion then i'd say yes um but at the same time you'd understand through archaeology and uh, uh, if you will Afrocentric study that some of the oldest churches in the world are here on the African continent, perhaps in East Africa and Ethiopia and the like. So those churches are older than the churches in Europe um, and older even than some of the churches, if you will, uh, in the Middle East and so where these three main re- Abrahamic religions, Islam, Judaism and Christianity started. So, so we, we, and also then you, you get into the debate around whether Christianity is another form of uh, Kemetic religion in um, Egyptology and, you know, the, the, the whole the, the gods and goddesses of Egypt. But that's perhaps a topic for another day. But what I'm trying to get at is that it's not a Western thing. Um, Christianity and the belief in God was here in Africa way before missionaries came here. In fact, some missionaries came from Africa to go into other places. And I think that that's a history that we've got to actually learn. So when a lot of people say that uh, the colonizer came with a Bible and a gun, Mm. um, I differ with the Bible part. uh, Because the Bible was already on the African continent in certain spaces, Mm. maybe not in Mm. South Africa, Mm. but it was already here. um, And we were practicing it. Some of the oldest Bibles are Ethiopian Bibles. Um, that have got way more books than what we now know as the canonical Bible with the 66 books and the Old and the New Testament. So I think it's important for us to also understand the the African origins of Christianity and reclaim them because uh, it's just like Afrikaans, for instance, on a side topic. It's a black language. Afrikaans was in this country way before the Dutch came. And so what they did, it's a kitchen language uh, that developed between the Cape Malay and the Indian people that were in the, in the Cape. And so there are uh, artifacts or manuscripts of the Quran that are written in that language uh, in the 1400s and 1500s. So they arrive here in the 1600s. So we can't even say that that language is a, is a white language and it's an oppressor's language. They took it. They stole a language in the same way that the colonizer stole Christianity and weaponized it uh, against black people particularly. All right, um, Doctor. Thank you so so much. Um, for lack of time, I'm gonna have to um, end our conversation here. But it definitely has been very, you know, insightful as well, to say the least. Um, I, Christianity is not a Western form of belief or tradition, according to you. And I also take away also the fact that we, as African people, can still fully experience God um, while still having or fostering a relationship with our ancestors. Thank you. Thank you once again, Doctor. I mean, Prophet. Thank you so much. That was, of course, Prophet Katleho Mukhase joining us in and shedding some light um, on the important conversation of African spirituality and religion.